I'm going to ask you just for 15 or 30 seconds, maybe difficult for some of you, 15 or th- to just say who you are right. and um, your, your company, and then sort of straight away afterwards, I'm going to then ask you a sort of second question, how IoT affects your particular business, so that might you know, take a little bit longer, yeah. and then perhaps, depending on the feedback, what you're doing, um, yeah, then we get on to a sort of a full, uh, a full discussion. So, okay. Martin, what do you do? Uh, my name is Martin Klaassen, and uh, I'm a lighting designer. I run my own practice, class and lighting design, based out of Singapore as its head office, with other offices in uh, Shanghai, Jakarta, and uh, Perth. Um, besides class and lighting design, this year I've started a new company called Lighting Design of Things, and I think that's what we're also going to talk about. Okay. Laura. My name's Laura Taylor, and I head up the design exploration team at Signify, and that means we do a lot of user research and a lot of experiments and demonstrators to look for the new roles that lighting can play. Hello, I'm uh, Nathanael Meyer. Uh, I work at GSM Project, a company based in Montreal, uh, 150 uh, people, uh, Montreal, Dubai, Singapore. And my role is I'm head of design there. Okay. So, and, and we do, uh, sorry, and we do exhibition design and attraction design. Okay, Peter. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm Peter <coughs> Raynham. Um, I'm someone who's been in the lighting industry too long. And so I've been working at a university for a number of years. And now I'm professor of the lit environment at University College London. First question of the afternoon. Um, right. Just talk for a couple of minutes, three minutes, on how IoT fix your business. Um, I think in a big way, because um, sometime last year I started to uh, discover that um, decisions about IoT in relation to lighting and light fixtures was coming from different people, like smart consultants or IT consultants. And as a lighting designer, I thought, hold on, um, I'm the lighting designer, I'm supposed to really be in charge of the lighting effects and the lighting ambience and moods and all that. Um, so I started studying what this all IoT means. And in the beginning of this year, I thought, I need to do something about this. Um, and I came up with uh, Lighting Design of Things as a, as a service platform in which um, we look at all these things that uh, come in from IoT, data infrastructure, and how that's going to link in to um, to our lights, the ones that we need to design, we need to position in space. And um, from there, it's been uh, quite a ride already. Um, we have now incorporated like design of things uh, as a company. Uh, we've got a website, and we provide that now as an additional service to our regular architectural lighting design services. So to me, it's, it's moving really fast, and uh, it's becoming something that we, uh, yeah, we, we're diving into head first. And you provide it as a service to your customers? Yes, you it's an additional service to our regular architectural professional lighting. So it's, we're exploring it. I mean, uh, it's, it's so new that we are trying to find our footing. We've done our first proposals. We're doing our first project where we provide this, um, what I call LDOT, as, as a, a additional service. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's really interesting. <laughs> Laura. What are you um, doing with IoT? Well, it affects our work in uh, two major ways. So firstly, um, before when we did design research, it was largely about the behavior of the light and you know the, the tasks that people did under that light. But when you connect all kind of other devices to it, you have to think of the bigger context and all the activities that take place in the space. So it's not just, for example, in the office about... Um, that you can see your screen well and that sort of thing, but it's about, um, like the presentation we had earlier, about the flows of people in the office and all sorts of other things to consider to get the, the bigger picture. So that's, um, that's one big change in terms of the research that we do. And the other thing is in, in we also design a lot of user interfaces or ingredients for user interfaces. And there, um, 
like the presentation we had just before lunch, um, we can instrument our design much better. So when we put an app out there, like the Hue app, we know within a day you know, how it's doing. We get the first feedback. So there's two, two ways that really are influencing my work at the moment. Okay. Thank you. For me, the concept of uh, Internet of Things, I think uh, I heard that years ago. It was more like a buzzword, like a technologic buzzword. Now I understand more what it is. And I, I saw in our, our field, in exhibition design, that we were already trying to do Internet of Things before the world was a buzzword. So trying to connect uh, each interactive element uh, in an exhibition to be able to uh, capture the content for the visitors, to specific visitors, and also to track data about the, the, the visitors' behavior. So right now, it's an uh, it's ongoing process to try to connect everything in an exhibition, so the exhibition becomes smarter and smarter. Um, so we are looking, uh, two days this morning I, I learned a lot of things about how lighting can be also integrated with all the other devices, so I think it's very positive, but uh, it's, I think it's still the beginning of uh, what we have to do with that, because at the end of the day, uh, we need that uh, designer are able to take all this uh, concept and all this data to make something which is not just data, but something which is useful for the visitor experience. Thank you. Peter. Okay, so the Internet of Things for us is, is quite a complex thing to get into because there's several levels we have to address it with. So in terms of teaching demand with students, we have to start, it's an extra deck of strategies we have to start explaining. Um, in terms of a research tool, well, it's something we've been using certainly in the thermal side and the hygrometry side for a long time, probably five years or more, and we've got partners in China who are making multi-point sensors which are IoT connected. But in the lighting world, it's becoming more important. Um, for example, we've just finished work commissioning a large-scale artificial sky, which has got 810 light sources spread across a dome. We've done it all with a device which is IoT connectable. Um, Writing the software is a complete nightmare, but hey, this is what we expect. And the IoT structure is brilliant because it means that you know when you send a message to something, it's going to get there. The problem is you don't know what messages you're likely to receive back from the rest of the world. So it really was quite an eye-opening experience actually commissioning one of these things, and it took a lot longer than planned. You, you've got an artificial sky connected uh, to the cloud, but I mean... Yes, why... obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but why did you do it? Why didn't you just have... I like to simplify things, sorry about this. Why didn't you have a wire coming out the back to, to get the results? Why was the need to collect... Well, you have to, you'd have to have 810 wires. Yeah, and that's the problem. So by, by just putting everything together on a, on a uh, SELV bus, then we could... Um, measure uh, um, performance and do calibration routines fairly straightforwardly all in software, which is why we did it that way, because in principle there's a lot less hardware involved. Okay, it take, takes a lot of time to stitch it all together in software, and I think that is, that is I think, one of the big, big problems in IoT is the development time for the actual products. Because you developed each light source to transmit a signal to the cloud. So you've got 800 signals going from it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'm now just thinking of lighting design, which as a profession is 50 years old, just about the first lighting design practices came out about uh, 50 years ago. And I'm just thinking the Googles and the Microsofts and the IT departments are going to take over lighting design. I say, if we're not careful, we might prefer that if we're more... Uh, computer minded, but certainly um, I'm going to ask the panel now whether you think there's going to be the same lighting design profession in the, f in the future. What are they going to do? Are they just going to say, this looks nice, that's what I do, I'm not concerned about data, or are they going to say, data's fantastic, don't care about the appearance? So I'm, 
like to just think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Martin knows because you started the company. <laughs> so I'll let you ask, ask, answer this Alan, question here, first. Here's the thing. You mentioned the mobile phone, and maybe that's a very good uh, uh, metaphor to, to explain what's going on. Ten years ago, with uh, a Nokia, you could basically phone and text, and uh, not much more. Today, if you look at your mobile phone, it can do so much more. Actually, the phone and texting is just minimal compared to all the things that you can do. You can pay, you can translate, you can internet, you can Google, you name it, you can do it, right? So, to me, lighting is going exactly the same way. The lighting point as we know it today will be totally different in a couple of years' time. It will be a digital hub in which lighting is probably a small part of what this can do. So, maybe 10%, it becomes really a byproduct. But in the end, it's still lighting. So. In order to, to position our lights and do our lighting design, we need to understand what kind of influences this IoT uh, will have on, on uh, the light fixture and, and, and how it drives, because it will be connected to either the driver or the light fitting or to whatever data infrastructure will be connected to it. So that's why it's really important to, for me as a lighting designer now, and that's why we are really studying this, to understand what is it um, that's available now and in the future uh, in terms of um, all these smart things. You, you can't call a day, daylight sensor and a present sensor smart. I mean, you can, but it's, we've had it for years and years and years. So if they come to me and say, oh, I've got this smart presence detection, um, that's not really new. I, I wouldn't really call that IoT. But it's what you can do with it. And if you talk, for instance, about a presence detection, um, there's several levels. You can detect somebody in a room. You can detect how many people are in the room. The next level up is where are they in the room? And the next level after this, who is actually in the room? So it's four different levels. Also a totally different amount of data that is related to it. Um, so you need to understand what it is that you're gonna do with all those IoT devices and what you intend to do with the data analytics that comes out of it. And how that then can drive back your lighting, your lighting controls, setting of scenes, but also other things like HVAC and, and you name it. So uh, I find it quite scary, to be honest, to see what's all happening. But to me, that is what we need to understand, what IoT is doing. And understanding that doesn't mean that I'm becoming an IoT specialist. I understand who are the partners that I need to deal with in order to create a lighting solution that satisfies all this. Do you, th do you think that, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, heating and ventilation. Do you think the heating and ventilation guys are going to move into lighting? Um, some may try, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. But we, we are getting smart consultants and uh, engineer companies that are starting to look into that. Yeah, for sure. It, it's happening. Uh, I've had uh, in two projects where from a totally different angle, somebody came to me and said, okay, these are the Wi-Fi positions that we need in relation to the lights. Um, and, and I'm thinking, I need to control that, uh, yeah. because in the end, I'm still here for the integrity of the, of the lighting design. So I see myself more as the facilitator and the integrator of IoT functions, and at the same time um, being the guardian uh, for good quality lighting design, because in the end it's still the visible part that we will have to deal with, even though there's a lot of invisible stuff happening. But, yeah, um, that's what I think the role of the new lighting designer in the future should be, is to be the guardian of good quality lighting design. Thanks, Matt. Laura, you do a lot of thinking about the future, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, your, your job's looking ahead much more than sort of day-to-day -day application. So I'm just, what, what do you think <laughs> what so, are these lighting designers going to be doing in a few years? Well, I think you're all going to be a lot busier and you're your job might be more, I think it's going to be necessary to stay with the projects more continuously, perhaps, or I don't know if that will be the solution, but because I, um, as it's about, um, it's going to be more about the whole usage over time. You saw that in the edge this morning. So it's not just the one-off design and deliver the building and then it's done. It's really thinking about the, the usage and all these um, devices yeah. that get connected to it. So the light settings might need to be adjusted or um, you know, it, it will go on in time and you'll get all the feedback as well from the data. So I think that's, um, that will have a consequence. Um, and also I think the, mm, the richness as, as well 
I, I mean, it's somehow connected to the IoT. So again, not so much a, a static design, but then the level of um, quality of the scenes and stuff like that will need to go up to respond, especially as people, for example, in an office uh, are moving around and they might go into different zones and these zones might need different kinds of lighting. So I think, the, I think it will be more continuous and more, more rich, the, the activities, and more parameters to deal with in terms of the qualities of light. So you think the lighting designers are going to be involved more for the life of the building than but they are now, instead of just washing their hands of it once it's been installed? You think they'll be continuing? I think they yes, a, 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 a sort of continuous advising role. I, I could imagine that, yes. Nathaniel, have you got a view on the, the lighting design? Because there are lighting designers who do <coughs> purely exhibition and event work, aren't there? Right. And it's, a, it's a huge challenge. For example, we have to uh, design an exhibition that's going to open in 2023. We're starting the concept right now. So with the knowledge we have right now about what is uh, accessible, what we can do with the data, I'm sure it's going to be irrelevant in five years from now. Yeah. I'm sure it's not going to be any way related to what we try to do for the visitor experience. So the way we approach lighting uh, and it's the same way we approach any field for exhibition design uh, is trying to postpone the most possible the specification of infrastructures or uh, fixtures to make sure that when our clients buy the actual stuff, they have the latest stuff. So this is a way we change uh, our behavior with uh, making the lighting design for exhibition. And also I agree with, uh, with Laura that more and more, um, I would suggest to clients that uh, use lighting design in their projects and they want to make it like for the, for the, the best of the visitor experience, um, to not try to spend all the money just at the opening of a building or just at the opening of an <coughs> exhibition. Uh, try to uh, spread the money during the life cycle of the whole uh, operation of the project. Meaning that uh, for each designer who work on the project, including lighting designers, they could gather all the data they, they, they got from the operation of an exhibition of a building and then still be creative. So from all this data, invent new solutions, spec new material, and uh, uh, give a, a longer life to a project instead of trying to, uh, to have the perfect project at the opening, which can at which can be obsolete really, really fast. So there is no chance that from now in five years I'm going to be able to specify the right things for the right mm -hmm. uh, project. So uh, I like this idea that uh, in the future designers will be involved more in operation and try to always find creative solutions to improve um, the visitor experience or the environments. It's interesting. What's your view, PC? You, you've been training them for 20 years, budding lighting designers, 25 yeah, years? More than that, even. Yeah. <laughs> so going back, I think there's always been something of a dichotomy in the way lighting is created. And there's been, traditionally, it was a very much an engineering approach. And it said that if I do this, this, and this, the lighting will be OK in that space. And running parallel to that, there's been a design approach where if I use some creative flair in creating my lighting, I'm going to get a much better result and everybody's happy. And I think the challenge faced by the community that did design was establishing some benefit. Um, to get, give you a feel, somebody was trying to explain to me the concept of lighting quality the other day. Well, actually, it's a little bit longer ago than that. But the concept he explained it was, it's a bit like the American legal definition of pornography, in that you'll recognise it when you see it. So that is a real, really difficult sales pitch for a lighting designer. I suspect that as we get more and more feedback on how lighting actually performs, what people do under it, then we're going to start to see even more greater emphasis on design rather than engineering. I think the, the days when we could design an office block, supply 300 lux on all the task areas, do 
do a couple of tick box exercises on the glare rating and uniformity are, are probably coming towards an end. I think the reason we use buildings has changed over the past 25 years, and I think the way we approach the lighting of them is going to change likewise. Can I add something to what the two previous speakers said? I think there's also um, a scope for some additional services, which I think Philips used it as active site or something, but I would like to call it des uh, design content management of content mm. maintenance, is that because the lights are all programmable and updatable and all that, there is a scope for providing lighting design um, management after a project is commissioned, exactly for that reason, because there will be a need to upgrade and to adapt to, to I don't know, seasons or things that you want to do. And with the lights all being smart and yeah. being updatable and upgradable, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, over the air, the same as your, your phone apps are being upgraded uh, without you knowing, um, this is happening in the future with lights as well. I think there's a, a definite scope for line designers to provide these sort of services also mm -hmm. after commissioning. That's, that's an interesting point, because there was something that two of you also uh, mentioned about the, the change of the profession. In fact, there's now uh, three of you, because all of you have said that the lighting designer won't have finished his job when the building gets built. You were talking about feedback coming in, improving on it, um, and of course, the technology itself um, changes over the years between, you know, five years, seven years for the building to get built. But now you're talking about the lighting design profession, if you like, receiving ongoing fees in as much as you almost like you could lease the lighting or you could rent the lighting and you could also, I suppose, have a sort of a, a maintenance contract with the lighting designers or the, light, the, the concepters um, to sort of make sure it keeps up to scratch with the, with the practice of the building and the changing use of the building. Is, it, is that fair? Anybody want to, yeah, yeah. to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'd like to add to your point about the active site and the yeah. light content. Yeah. So um, also this use of uh, dynamic light content and that people actually get bored with it as well. So there's a really a need mm. from users to, to get refreshed content. Then I'm talking about things like um, like those active site, you know, like on a bridge or on a large luminous surface, something like that, where you have uh, a flow of content on it. Mm. That that also needs to be designed and um, refreshed. The beauty is you can probably do it from your office. It's all like yeah. remote and connected. And, so. and also the meaning of it, you know, that it's not... Um, that it's connected to what's going on in that location yeah. and all these things that have to be uh, thought about. Uh, I have, a, I think, a good example of how it could work as a business model for lighting designers. Uh, we've worked on a project in uh, Dubai, which is the observation deck of Burj Khalifa. And it involves a lot of uh, architectural, architectural spaces. Uh, so we've done the interior architecture, and obviously we had a thinking about how to do the lighting design. So the lighting design is related to the story we try to tell, is related to... Um, to the ambience you want to, uh, to make. So in a way, it's designed like a, like a show, like a show, like a journey you have. Uh, mm -hmm. And you use all the tools, uh, RGB, uh, intensity. Uh, we can uh, make different moods for different time of day, different time of week, uh, different moods for uh, uh, numbers of people. So if you have a lot of people, you change the mood. If there's so, so many, not much people, you change the moods too. Um, so I remember being on the site uh, just two weeks before the handover to the client, uh, being with uh, one engineer and uh, some, some people trying to do all the adjustments, as because I'm a creative director, what do you want? More, more purple, uh, more uh, intense, less intense? And I said, okay, change it. And when I'm satisfied at the end of the day, it's not the, the final result. It doesn't make sense because I've done the exercise once, I, don't, uh, I tried it, but when I saw people inside the, the building uh, interact with everything, not only lighting, I wanted to change everything. Yeah. Uh, but how did, how did they interact with it? I mean, do they 
push a button to make the wheels go round? I mean, yeah, how so, do they interact with so, your so, exhibition? Yeah, to, so practically, that's, that's, a, that's a, a PDR uh, project like that are um, organized in the way we deliver to the, to the client. At the end of the day, we deliver to operators. Mm. And uh, they want you to make the perfect thing right away. So we uh, record the program for the full week. And then it's on a computer sitting somewhere. But we have this full system, and it's Philips, by the way, which can do everything. But at the end of the day, nobody's going to touch it if it's not broken. But I think it's, there is a lot of room for improvement. But it's been uh, open for like six to seven months, and nothing has, has changed. Maybe one thing has changed is maybe somebody like the janitor or the operator think, oh, it's too too dull, oh, this is too bright, and change things, but without thinking of the whole context and everything, and then the whole lighting fall apart. So I think there is room for a designer to maintain, yeah. uh, with all the perfect tools to maintain the, the, the light numbers and maybe to improve it over time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think what you're picking up here is that design evolves with time, and it's not just lighting, pretty much any time you build a building as an organization, what you wanted the building for, the requirement will have changed by the time it's built. By definition, a building is never going to be optimum for what it's meant to be. And so the more tools that you have available to adapt and bring around the building to being something more useful, the better it's going to be. Um, in general terms, um, a building probably has got a life of 150 years. Now, I'm, as a lighting designer, designing the lighting for a building today, I'm going to have a real struggle thinking about what that's going to be done in 150 years' time. So it's reasonable to assume periods of refurbishment and periods of maintenance of existing schemes. Um, the real question in my mind is, as technology is evolving so rapidly, can what we install today still take the upgrades we need for, for five years' time? Um, you probably change your smartphone every three years, and it just about keeps up with the app upgrades. If you've got lighting in there for 25 years, is the equipment going to cope? <laughs> That's it. How are you going to manage that upgrade process? So it's going to be, there's going to be some interesting problems, both for the lighting designers and for the um, facilities management crews. It's a challenge to the lighting manufacturers, I would think, to design something that's upgradable. Yeah. Well, I was, I was uh, speaking to a, a consultant in the UK uh, just the other day, and he doesn't specify any product where you can't uh, replace the drivers and the LED modules. He says he expects the fitting to be in the ceiling for 25, 30 years, but he expects everything else within it uh, to be replaceable and quite simply, he uses his, his strength as the designer and says, I'm not going to specify a, a luminaire, you know, a light fitting, unless all the parts can be easily replaced. It, it's quite interesting that uh, all of you spoke about this ongoing uh, maintenance. It's almost like uh, luminaire manufacturers who will rent the equipment or lease the equipment you know, we will just give you light for the next 25 years rather than purchasing it. Mm. And you were saying because you can, you can upgrade it. Yeah. yeah. And now the lighting design profession is, well, you're saying the lighting design profession is saying, well, actually, you can, instead of a fee, you'll have an annual fee from me to maintain it uh, for a quarter of a century instead, you know, which is... But good even for good continuity. Even for the specifications, we wait till the last, very last minute to confirm the specifications. And we have projects where, because of the quick succession of upgrades of light fittings, like your iPhone you know, 9, 10, etc., uh, the, the light fittings follow the same sort of pattern. So you find yourself holding on or updating your specifications till the last moment before you go for tender. I think that happens yeah. uh, for you yeah. as well. So yeah, that's the, the world we live in. But if they are upgradable and become programmable, uh, through the internet or to, to wireless or remote controls, then is an additional interest because then we can keep up with the changes that are needed. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting uh, uh, idea that uh, 
a lot of uh, infrastructures now need less and less uh, wiring too. Mm. And I think it's going to be more and more in the future. And I have a, another example it, which is related to this leasing idea of uh, material. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept of uh, people uh, leasing carpet for offices. So instead of trying to find the right carpet for your offices, you rent carpet yeah. for 10 years. So you don't know what kind, uh, you don't know where the carpets come from and you don't have to um, throw it out. So there is a company taking care of the carpet for you. Um, and the carpet is upgraded as it's broken, it's upgraded and uh, maintained over, uh, uh, over a lease of 10 years. So I think with lighting it could be uh, the same thing. So you'll always be up to date. Uh, fixture with, which would be uh, um, obsolete will be replaced, but recycled. And you can upgrade, upgrade over years with a leasing contract uh, all your lighting. Makes sense if you don't have a full infrastructure behind the ceilings and the, and the walls. But in the future, I think it could happen, like a, a service. Not really, it's, it's not future, it's now already. Yeah. It's already part of the business model to, yeah. to offer light as a service. Uh, you mean with, with, the, with the infrastructures too? Sorry? With the infrastructures too? It depends on, on, yeah. on the, 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 say, consortium that we're going to help yeah. you do the light as a service, yeah. but it's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think Amsterdam Airport, if I'm not mistaken, is already yeah. part right. of that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. It's already happening, it's here. But that can go a whole step further, and you see now office space as a service. Mm. You can have yeah. office hubs. There's no reason for a company to have its own office. It, it can have office hubs throughout the world. It can have access in any business centre in the world to an office hub. So that's taking it a step further, and that gives you the opportunity as if you then start connecting those offices to actually have a unified user experience across the globe. And there's some really interesting ideas behind there. How far it will go in the next five years, I don't know, but it'll be interesting to see. Is that going to make, when you're linking the lighting design service across the world, I'm just thinking, I'm gonna say thinking out loud, really. Is that going to lead to more conformity of design, or is that going to make designs more disparate? Is, is there going to be a global lighting design solution, or will it just mean there's more and more individual designs as a result? Well, at this stage, I don't know. It may be that people, when they go to Shanghai, expect a particular style of office and expect a different style in New York. But who knows? There may be some brand globalisation. After all, McDonald's isn't quite identical around the world yet. But maybe they've, they're aiming for that, I don't know. I don't think there's a standard way of solving yeah. things. It's no, always I don't think there's a standard way. I think, no. I was just asking whether you think there's a <coughs> risk that there, that there might be. Every no. client is different, I think. Every environment has different requirements. Yeah. You will have to find a solution that fits. And no, I don't, I don't think it's... Uh, Maybe it's the contrary. In the future, more, more the lighting designers have tools, so more they can express mm. yeah, exactly. themselves. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's the contrary. Maybe we are getting away uh, from uh, one solution for all. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Well, maybe it's, it's turning into a lighting design as a service, as well yeah. as, light as lighting a as a service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is a service, but... Okay. Yeah, there's many cultural differences in lighting, of course. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. If the platform enables designers to really personalize and customize in an easier way, mm. so they can really get on with what's the important thing they have to do, and the technology is just enabling. In a way, it's a sort of platform for customizing the luminaires, isn't it? Also, in, in that's also, yes. Yeah. Something, yes. something that you, you'll be thinking about. Yes. Yeah. Good idea. It keeps keeps uh, keeps everyone in, in business. But I got um, a related question. I'm just going to assume that you're all specify going to specify lighting, and that your arms are just a bit bit too heavy to lift. So uh, I'll, um, I'll assume that you're all um, going to specify lighting. Um, a worry that uh, concerns me, in as much as um, there's all these other disciplines like heating and ventilation, building services, obviously the IT people want, uh, want a, a piece of the cake as well. Um, 
who's going to be responsible for the design? Supposing someone falls down the stairs because it's dark, and you say, oh, well, that's the IT department's fault because they switch off the computers at 11 p.m. Supposing, supposing something goes wrong, who's going to be responsible for the design in the future? If everything's connected and the client can change it, or the IT people can change it, or the heat and vent guy can change it, who's, who's going to look after it? Who's going to take the legal responsibility for it? Good question. Um, I think this also points to the need for partnerships because as a line designer, if you're going to be the facilitator, integrated, or integrator of all these IoT services and whatever is linked to it, you need to have partnerships. Uh, I, I cannot be, be pretending that I'm, I'm a specialist in, in certain areas that I'm not. Um, so you need the partnerships. If you look at um, like this, this design content management, you need to partner up with the supplier and the manufacturer. Um, we can do, uh, we can take the responsibility for the content design, but we can, we have to work with, with the manufacturer and supplier that, that supplied the light fixture and the programmable fixture. So it needs to be a sort of a team effort, and then within that team effort and, and that partnership, you can define the, the responsibility roles. Um, but it is, it is a very good question, and I think as we move along, we'll, we'll sort of define where the responsibilities are. I, I can't say that I know exactly, but I do know that there's an enormous need for partnerships in this new world of, uh, of IoT, and that's where we will need to, to find where the responsibilities are. Are you going to say something? Uh, also a small uh, anecdote. So as, as um, lighting and IoT, it becomes all connected. Also, there'll be uh, unexpected use cases will I'm cross sure, each yeah, other. Absolutely. So I heard one last week, which is, so in our schools and offices, we want to install occupancy sensors for, um, to save extra energy, for example. And then in the States, where they're very um, concerned about children's safety in the schools for all the things that have been happening recently, um, if they do like a lockdown, you know, then it has, that occupancy sensor has to not go off, of course. You see what I mean? So there are these use cases that might kind of come together and make a third situation that you need to think of up front or, or, or ongoing. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, okay. Nathaniel, have you got so, uh, maybe, to add? <clears throat> maybe I, I didn't understand the question, but maybe we, we, we could be worried that uh, because the material is so easy to use, that anybody could, could use it, uh, even people with non-sensible way to do lighting. So they have all the tools, they have all the connectivity, so they can. So maybe the question is how we guarantee the work, the creative yeah. work? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's the same for each uh, uh, creative work. We have to, to uh, acquire the trust of people that we are the right people to call mm -hmm. for content. And uh, because uh, all the tools are available, it's may maybe like your, your camera on your phone. If you're good enough, you can do a, a good YouTube podcast. But uh, it doesn't mean every, anybody can do a good uh, 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 podcast. So uh, maybe more lighting designers will rise up with those tools. Don't, don't, we won't have to be like the, the specialist of all the how it works, but the specialist of the mood and the feeling. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, as designers, we have to acquire the trust of people that we are the right people to call for good content. So we are the, the creative. Mm -hmm. I think, this, I think this, this is the only way to guarantee it because we cannot just protect it with a, a file, with a lock, uh, mm -hmm. to make sure mm -hmm. that they don't change it. I think there's probably two or three quite interesting points in this area. And I think the first one is that whenever we introduce new technology with extra levels of complexity. I don't think everyone foresees everything that possibly could happen to the system as it evolves. I suspect within 18 months to two years, most of the major things will get found, and that will be fine. And where we are today, we have, if you like, process-driven communication, and so in potentially, it's fully auditable, if something goes wrong, we can find out why. 
The worrying trend may be that if we start to introduce AI into these controls, we will no longer have that auditor. It will no longer be auditable. We will not have any idea why the, the system decided to take certain actions. And I suspect they're probably going to be, in the built environment, um, legal problems with implementing AI. That's another hour's of discussion. I think there's a lot I think of we could go for a couple of weeks there, <laughs> Alan. Yeah, a lot of, lot of uh, material there. There was a program yeah. on television just recently about uh, machine learning, mm -hmm. and uh, some were saying the machine learnt, but we don't actually know what it did. This is just the outcome. Yeah. That's exactly the same as you're saying. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the, the machine produces an outcome but it's not auditable because the machine learnt it or the AI yeah, exactly. learnt it and not the, uh, not the humans who built it in the first place. And uh, that almost takes you back to the, well, it does take you back to the responsibility question, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know? Yeah, once you, get the, once you get the software learning how the space gets used and then adapting the lighting according to how the space gets used, um, yeah, that's... It's not your responsibility anymore, is it? No, no, or is it's it? still, I, I very much see it as a teamwork. Lighting, mm. a lighting designer has always been part of a team. It's not just a standalone thing. You have to work with the architects, you have to work with all the other players involved. And now with IoT involved, it's becoming even a, a bigger pool of players. <laughs> well, yes, so the, uh, the machine's part of your team in a way, isn't yeah. it? The, uh, yeah. the machine. We, we don't really exist without the others. No. Yeah. No. Anybody want to add? Any yeah. for it? Uh, uh, I talked to my IT guy in uh, back in Montreal and I said, what do you think about Internet of Things? <laughs> and the thing he said to me, I'm worried about hacking. About? <laughs> hacking. Hacking, yeah, hacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was his first uh, answer because he's an IT guy. He has to always take care of those problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what, is, what are the regulations in the Netherlands, but I don't know who is responsible, uh, responsible when there is a hacking problem. Is it the lighting designer? Is it the engineers? It is the, I don't know. Uh, Wait, I've got my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's an it's a all new uh, w uh, field of, uh, of maybe a potential uh, issues. Yeah, legal yeah. issues. Nathaniel, did your colleague actually come up with some answers about security? Or did he have some good ideas? No, I think it's uh, going to give a lot of jobs to people who, who do programming <laughs> to protect <laughs> everything. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of stories where uh, buildings have been hacked or uh, yeah. uh, uh, Uber infrastructures or uh, Airbnb or Google itself. So, uh, yes, this is something we have to, to think about because I don't think it's a real problem because we found, we found every time a solution to protect the system. The only problem I see is when it's getting complicated for people, and then it become less creative. So what we can uh, do? So it's become it becoming like a, a gate to innovation because we have to protect everything. For quite a few years now, um, people have been talking about uh, human-centric lighting, and some lighting designers say, "Well, I always design for humans, and so there's nothing uh, special." And then you get some manufacturers who say. We've got two LEDs, a warm one at 2,700K and a cool one at 6,000, and that adjusts to everything you need for human-centric lighting. Um, it's not. It's colour-tunable. That's all it is. But I was just wondering how much of an effect, uh, whether you think human-centric lighting is maybe just something that people talk about and don't actually do, or is it going to be a serious contender alongside IoT that you're going to... In integrate into your schemes? I, first of all, I agree. We design for people. We don't design, design for lux meters. So it's always been <laughs> part and centra, central to our, our design philosophy. But um, this circadian lighting or, or human-centric lighting is not only about the visible effects. It's reproducing natural light. It's also about the invisible part of what lighting can do. And that's what many light designers think don't realize. And even for us, we, we, we still need to sort of research sometime case to case um, when we try to do uh, tunable lighting. Um, we have done it for banks and all that, and some of it is just you reproduce sort of daylight, but it's actually much more. It's not just the visible part, but it's also the invisible part. 
And that invisible part is where the researchers have, have uh, you know, can tell you what part of the spectrum is important for, for the different environments for, for which you design the lighting. And uh, I think it's a really important part. Uh, we certainly promote it as a, as a specific uh, item on the menu, so to speak. Um, and and uh, I think it has to be part of, of our design at all times. Uh, we need to see. We don't need to do it just because we can, but we should do it where it's necessary and where, where it makes sense to do it. Uh, Have you got particular uh, customers who ask for it more than other customers? I mean, is there a particular group of some, people who want to? Some are switched on and, and they, they, they ask for it. Some they don't, but then we discuss the opportunities uh, of, of doing it. and, and um, if they get it, uh, they'll do it. If they have the budget, they'll do it. Um, it's very often also the, what kind of uh, value-added uh, proposition do you have when you, when you do it. Uh, in the end, at least in, in my part of the world, it's always about the dollars and cents, and you really need to educate the, your client about the added value that you can bring for, for all these things. Um, and very often, that would be the first thing that's been cut out of the design if they don't have the money. Um, but it's all a, also a matter of really being able to educate your clients of what it is. It's not just about the money. It's also about the, the, yes. the, the benefits. So, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, absolutely something that, uh, that needs to be included, according to me. Anybody else? Yes, so, so I agree there's this, this the, the real biological effect, which yeah. I think there's a lot of confusion about you know, tunable white and the real biological yeah. effect and what, what we call human-centric lighting. But um, that said, um, I think as well as this biological kind of light nutrition that people need yeah. to have a certain dose of each day, um, I think you know, the way it's delivered um, could be done in a more, um, a way, a more human way yeah. as well, like a meal, like it can be nutritional, but the way it's um, presented and uh, the taste of it and all these elements. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the, the light delivery devices that we have, which haven't changed that much in the last um, 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, we still have the stick and the square and these kind of elements and um, got very inspired by the work of um, light artists like Daniel Rybeck and who, who explore the subconscious effects of di daylight, you know, the sort of shafts of light and the, the diffuse patterns and things on the windows. So I'm sort of imagining in the future that we would have a, a kind of, there would be a more um, a portfolios of interesting devices to create really a rich effect in the room that's really connecting us to nature much more and really, as, as well as doing the biological thing, caring for us through the day. Uh, yeah, Daniel, yeah for, for, uh, for, for user-centered uh, lighting, for us it's really different because we work in exhibition and attraction. So we don't try to reproduce uh, the, bio the cool biological uh, effect of a, a full day. Uh, it's not always about comfort, it's also about uh, destabilizing the visitors to tell a story. So we use uh, lighting in a totally different way. So we're more looking for the all new kind of tool to disrupt uh, mm -hmm. the ambiences to bring people elsewhere. So uh, we don't have this concept of uh, human-centered uh, lighting. Uh, it's more like uh, anchored in the story uh, mm -hmm. you try to tell. Human it's really totally different from lighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we try to tell a story, and lighting is a tool to, to try to tell a story and to give an ambience. Yeah. Yes, it's, yeah, exhibition work is, is a lot different from commercial work. Definitely. Isn't yeah. it? It's not it's always about different. comfort. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Uncomfort. Anyway, so I think the idea that human-centric lighting has come along out of the blue from nowhere is not quite the case, but I think it's, it's a good concept to have there because... I think as a profession, we've said we're lighting for people for many, many years, but secretly we've been lighting buildings. Yeah, we've been putting our effort into getting 300 lux on a desk or something and doing a tick box exercise to make sure it's comfortable. But really we want to start to light for people. And there was some really nice research papers written in the past five years talking about how we generate rooms with things like 
perceived adequacy of illumination, how we generate rooms which are comfortable for people. And those spaces have not yet, those ideas have not fully filtered into practice yet. Um, with regard to circadian entrainment, making sure that we're alert at work, then I think 99 times out of 100, the true answer is have good daylight. Yeah. If you, the sun and the sky have been doing this naturally for millions of years, and basically we sort of evolved to get used to it. So if you've got an office desk which is in sight of a window, you're probably all right. That's not to say that there aren't the odd situations, people working night shift, people in control rooms, where, the, where these techniques of changing colour temperature of light are useful. But for people who can see a window, then generally they're OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a whole new thing in a way, because if it were just human-centric and based on daylight, yeah. we'd all finish work when it got dark and that would be the end of it. It's only that, because people work in the idea, evening and night time. Can we introduce that? I'd love to finish I'll work when it got <laughs> dark. <laughs> yeah, it'd be 16-hour days in the summer and, uh, yeah. and four-hour days in, uh, in Norway in the winter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we can... There's a limit to, uh, yeah. you know, to circadian lighting in that, in that, in that respect. Um, well, this too is not only about circadian lighting. I want to support what Nathaniel is saying. That one, one real estate developer once put it to me as follows. He said, Martin, I don't care what you're saying. There's only two things that interest me. One is reduce the cost as much as possible. Two, improve the human experience as much as possible. He said, the other thing, I don't care, but these are the two things that are for me important. And that doesn't mean just circadian lighting, it's experience of maybe yeah. what your exhibitions or your events. Yeah. And so when we talk human, uh, human experience, yeah. uh, it's, it's not just circadian lighting. Uh, it's, yeah. I want to reconfirm that. It's uh, <laughs> much more than that. Yeah. Do, do you think that um, we've got the right language? for it. I mean, Peter was talking about circadian entrainment. I know what that means, but not many people would do, generally. And I'm just trying to think whether we can get the ideas across. Because, Laura, you were saying mm. something last night about how to explain to people what you can actually do with domestic light fittings. Do you, have, you got all, have you got all the words to sort of uh, tell people, or, or is there still mm. a new... I don't want to say a new language to discover, but I mean, is that something yeah. missing from, uh, from the description of things? Yeah, I think it's missing. I mean, if you see what the paint companies have done, you know, they took, uh, I think maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there was just a few kind of shades you could paint your house, and now you have this whole portfolio mm. with all, all different uh, lovely words to describe uh, colors and it really evokes a kind of image for you to help uh, decorating and we've been doing that with with hue as well so we've got 30 light scenes in the in the hue app and we've given them names mm -hmm. like the city lights group and the um, the relax collection of scenes to 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 help people yeah because people don't aren't really used to talking about Light. That's, it, that's what I'm yeah. thinking of. Yes. Do we need yeah. a new language? Yeah, I think I think so. Yes. Yeah. But, but although you say language, but the thing is, with light, you have to experience it, don't you? So it's also really hard to to give it words that evoke something. Feeling. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I saw a light fitting the other day, and it was color changing. And I thought, what what's new? And they said, well, it's color changing for uh, water applications. In other words, it's for marinas, people, you've got enough money to have an indoor pool and that kind of thing. And the whole uh, colour palette, the whole RGB was based around, it's just going to be seen under the water. And I thought, that's, that's quite a neat idea because you don't, you know, that's, that's a very particular application. Mm. Maybe just to add, so people have incredible rich experiences of life in, their, in nature and, in, in, and over, over time. So they do know it, they feel it. It's just, it's so, um, it's kind of hardwired and they're just not put, used to putting it in words. And I think that's where this vocabulary of light topic uh, comes up. Especially as we're going to get all these rich effects. I mean, maybe in your um, work you, um, you, you have more 
uh, effects and things? Maybe you, just, you have a way to describe them. So for vocabulary and semantic, it's really, really a difficult task for a designer to try to explain to anybody what he's trying to do, as he's trying to achieve. The only tools we have right now are words, renderings. Now we can use a bit of uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Still, it's not the real thing. Uh, and uh, it's only when it's done that you can see how it makes you feel. So trying to explain it, it's a really difficult task for designers. So I, personally, I didn't find any way to do it properly to explain to a client what it's going to achieve. But I think your analogy of paint is the best. So we try to give them some, uh, yeah, it's like sun rising, or it's like uh, um, noon, or it's like uh, end of day. So it's easier for them to understand. But it doesn't describe the full spectrum of effect we, we try to convey. So we related also to, uh, so there's another tool we use, which is we tend to compare it to movies. So we say, oh, you know that movie? You know the ambience on that movie? Yeah, this is what you try to achieve. So we have to find comparison to, uh, to try to explain uh, how, how, uh, how it feels, because we don't have all the words to explain it. Yeah, well, that's a nice idea, isn't it? That's uh, yeah. comparing, it to, uh, comparing it, your designs to, to movies and the effect that you want. But, but here, you, you mentioned virtual reality. Uh, yeah. I attended a, a line design forum in Singapore about I think two weeks ago, and somebody, I forgot his name, um, presented this new virtual reality program um, where you can, in real time, change and adapt mm -hmm. your lighting positions, the, the, the furniture positions, but also the finishes, what type of light you can move in space. And mm -hmm. it's like you have these, these goggles on and you, you can play around and you can really right. experience what it would be in virtual reality. And yeah. I think very much uh, this is going to happen in the future. Uh, as a tool to, yeah. to really uh, transmit your ideas uh, and even give your client the opportunity to play around. So what if we move it to here? What do we, yeah. if we do this? Yeah. And you can do it in virtual reality. Yeah, virtual reality is, uh, like, even for designers, it's a uh, perfect tool because you can do it in real time right now. Mm. And you can explore things we couldn't imagine before in yeah. just plan view. <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. yeah. OK. Oh, we, we need. We need a new language, a uh, new language of light. And that's going to be even more, uh, more needed as we talk about these international schemes. Because, you know, what cosy or a warm, cosy light might mean in one part of the world might have a different meaning in another part of the world. So, uh, with the psychologists and the linguists, as it was with the psychologists and the IT people yeah. in the lighting design team, we might even need um, linguists and lexicographers to uh, to join <laughs> to join you as uh, to join you as well.